I'm Laurie Blake. This is the Wrestle Talk News, and on Tuesdays we wear punk. I, I mean, a pink. Sorry, because yes, our top story is all about CM. Hang on. You mean it isn't? It's not. Are you sure? You're joking. Because yes, our actual lead story is regarding a potentially disgruntled star perhaps teasing her impending departure from WWE. The star in question is Lacey Evans, who has become more and more known for frequent character repackagings than her actual in-ring exploits in recent years. While no concrete details are known, Lacey did make a curious post on Twitter, posting a whole bunch of eye emojis, a devil emoji, and a hand gesture of so close, like the one that Shelton Benjamin used on Triple H back on that Raw in 2004. Yeah, you know, you know, you know the one. Anyway, along with the emojis, Evans posted a gif with the caption, Roger, how many days left? Suggesting perhaps that her contract in WWE could be up in the near future. As I said, there's, there's, there's little else to go on here, but make sure to stay tuned for the updates. It seems like it's so close. All right. As promised in the intro, it's one Bill Phil time, baby, because yesterday it was reported that one of the people in Punk's firing line following his return had been Ryan Nemeth, stemming from his June 18th tweet calling Punk the softest man alive in response to his collision return promo. Now, Five Force Select have confirmed that Punk's confrontation with Nemeth happened at the June 21st AEW Dynamite in Chicago. However, there seems to be conflicting accounts of Punk's demeanor during the exchange. Firstly, sources close to Punk paint a more civilized picture claim claiming that Nemeth was working with the tweet to get heat and score points with his friends, aka the elite. Punk implored him not to do it again as tensions were high and they were trying to move on. Nemeth then apologized. The two shook hands and moved their separate ways. Punk obviously shook hands in the civilized manner with his pinky in the air. However, in a different account from PW Torch's Wade Keller, the exchange went far differently with Punk reportedly angrily and aggressively confronting Nemeth in the locker room, asking if they had a problem or they needed it to settle things outside, like his Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. Keller also notes that the exchange was witnessed by many in the locker room and was described as awkward and weird. Following the exchange, Nemeth has laid low and come off of social media, with Keller noting that he felt his job could be at risk if he spoke out against Punk behind the scenes. Interestingly, when it comes to Punk's post-collision promo on Hangman Page, it seems he does have some sort of remorse. Remorse for the horseman. The Rumor Horseman. Nick Houseman stated on House of Wrestling that Punk felt bad for his comments with Voices of Wrestling, later revealing that Punk actually reached out to apologize to Paige via text message. They also stated that Punk wasn't responsible for Paige being sent away from Collision in Greensboro, and if he had known he was there, he would have tried to talk to him in order to possibly work together in the future. Despite this, Voices of Wrestling note that there is zero indication that Paige and the Bucks want the Punk feud at all, with Fightful Select stating that the situation makes them want to distance themselves more from Punk. Now there's loads to unpack here, so make your way over to WrestleTalk.com for more. But now it's time to catch up with Mark Markison to find out about some of the best wrestling from across the world this week. Well, I can barely contain my excitement as it's time to share another potential match of the year brought to you by G1 expert and former Explorer Scout, Mark Markison. Hi, Luke. How was your week? Actually, it was Sounds quite... dull. You won't be surprised to hear there was even more outstanding wrestling to be found lighting up New Japan in the G1 climax. The most tense and compelling of all was Will Ospreay versus El Fantasmo. The stakes couldn't have been higher as whoever won this match would advance to the quarterfinals. We started with chain wrestling and some exquisitely placed strikes. It was perfectly balanced as if each man had the other's number, but it wasn't long before the action became more intense. Osprey spilled to the outside, ELP seized his chance, a beautiful assay in Moonsault connected, and he threw Osprey back into the ring to hit a picture perfect senton bomb and another top rope at Moonsault. It was so clean, so precise. This man makes high risk look like no risk at all. But hoisted on his own petard, ELP waited a little too long to take full advantage and Osprey got right back into it. The tension was building and ELP barely made it back into the ring before the 20 count and with just five minutes before a time limit draw, neither man was willing to back down. The closing sequence was a breathless run of near falls and any one of them could have been the clincher. Even I can't find the words to do it justice, so I'm going to insist you seek it out. I won't spoil who wins, but I will say... You'll have a great time. Kevin Kelly said, call five friends and tell them to turn on NJPW World, and he was damn right. Fortunately, I didn't have to because all five of my friends were already there watching it with me. I took all of our ratings, combined them for an average, and let me just say, tag 14, more like 14 stars. Sorry, did you say 14? 14, one, four, 
stars. I added everyone's together, divided them by the number of us there were, 14 stars. That's just getting ridiculous now. I, I don't make the rules. I, th I think you do. Well, then obey them. I, th I think he does make the rules. It's his rating system, isn't it? No, it's not yours. I know it's not yours. No, it's his. Well, make him do it properly then. But now it's time for my review of Monday Night Raw, aka, well, this was a throwaway show until the final few minutes edition of Monday Night Raw in about five minutes. The show opened with the Judgment Day coming out for a promo and you'll never guess what they said. Rhea Ripley said that the Judgment Day ran Monday Night Raw and Damian Priest talked about how Finn Balor wasn't with them because there are troubles in the group. Look, I appreciate that, like a comic book, Every episode of Raw is someone's first episode of Raw, so you need to recap stories and bring new audiences up to speed. But there is a better way of doing this for those for whom this is not their first episode of Monday Night Raw. And believe me, this is not my first episode of Monday Night Raw. In a new-ish twist, JD McDonough came out to deliver a message from Finn Balor, but it was a friendly message. Sami Zayn came out and brawled with JD, while the other JD, that being Judgment Day, watched on. This led to a match between Sami and JD, McDonough that is, which was designed to get McDonough over in defeat, as he's not really been featured in ring since he was brought up to the main roster all those months ago. It was a totally fine match, and Sami overcame a Finn Balor distraction to hit the Haluva kick for the win. Chelsea Green wanted to pitch to Adam Pearce her great social media idea for holding auditions for a new tag partner, which could give us at least three weeks of entertaining vignettes, but, but then Piper Niven just walked in and said that she was the new tag team champion, and, and that was that. Look, I'm glad that Piper is getting something to do, but this feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. Imperium cut a promo on Alpha Academy, and Ludwig Kaiser continued his flirtatious ways with Maxine Dupree, and Chad Gable beat Giovanni Vinci in a standard match to give Gable some momentum for his IC match with Gunther. And speaking of momentum, Gunther then beat Otis with an impressive powerbomb. Gunther once again teased a split of Imperium, stopped trying to split this team up, and set up an IC title match for next week's Raw. There was... Another backstage argument between Balor and Priest, which was broken up by a rear rear please be oh, I want us to get on the same page. I nail Aussie accents every time, and I feel like I'm in Groundhog Day. Not Kathy Kelly interviewed Drew McIntyre, who was set up to be Matt Riddle's new tag partner against the Viking Raiders, a match which they won with relative ease. Well, it's not what I would do with Drew McIntyre, who was just the new Elias, who was already the new Randy Orton, who in a way was the new Timothy Thatcher, who in a way was the new Pete Dunne, but this should lead to some fun backstage segments. For example, they met with New Day backstage later on in the show, which was all sorts of entertaining, and a match was made between them the next week. Blimey, you can tell that Vince McMahon isn't around at the moment to stick his creative fingers in the booking pie, because not only is JD McDonough back on TV and back in his Judgment Day storyline that was dropped a few months ago, Indy Hartwell is also back along with Candice LeRae. I think we just need to get Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa DIY reunion and we'll get to complete the bingo card. Indy even got a video package to explain who she was to an audience that probably is unaware of of who she is, which, you know, is great in getting over her character. And then she lost to Rhea Ripley in a short squash match. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a naff use of Indy Hartwell, considering you just gave her a video package, but this wasn't about her, or Candice LeRae, or The Way, if they're still a team, that is. This was all about furthering the feud between Rhea Ripley and Bakel Rodriguez, with Indy and Candice being used as the Vinci Kaiser cannon fodder to build Rhea up. It's simple and effective, and Indy will get her chance at a different point. Michael Cole interviewed Shinsuke Nakamura in the ring, and who, like a blooming heel, cut a promo in his native tongue. Oh, I can't understand what you're saying, boo you, etc. This was, honestly, the coolest Nakamura has looked in a while. Seth Rollins came out to announce that he accepts Nakamura's challenge, and Shinsuke responded by lost in translationing into Rollins' ear, which distracted him enough to get another Kinshasa to the back of their head. Something quite intriguing in all of that. What exactly did Shinsuke Nakamura whisper? Wrong answers in the comments down below. Byron Saxton interviewed The Miz backstage about LA Knight, yeah, and Trish Stratus and Becky Lynch finally got their big blow-off match because their other big blow-off match was taken off SummerSlam, and it ended in a double count-out to set up another final big blow-off match because the other big blow-off match was taking off a of SummerSlam. This is like naming a Photoshop file Final Dash Really Final Dash Version 2.5.psd. The gimmick here was that Zoe Stark was banned from ringside, so they brawled to the concession stand and got counted out, and then Stark attacked Becky because she's no longer at ringside, which is fine if you don't think about it, but the second you put any thought into it, you'll figure out that the match was over anyway, so the stipulation wasn't in effect anymore. Stark could have attacked her in the ring after the match because 
well, the match is over and she's no longer barred from ringside. But they used this as a justification to set up another match, this time in a steel cage, and it was frankly quite lame. And the main event saw Cody Rose beat Finn Balor, despite loads of interference from Judgment Day. Balor asked for the briefcase to be slid into the ring, but it went between his legs like he's Wiley Coyote and he had a big doop face on him, and then Rose won. This was a this was a bland episode of Raw that needed a hot angle, and we basically sort of got one. As JD McDonough turned out to be the difference maker for Judgment Day, and they laid out Rhodes and Zayn in spectacular fashion. Judgment Day are back on the same page! again, but perhaps this interference might convince Priest to welcome JD into the fold. Aside from all of that, it was a bland episode of Raw, which I'm going to give 2 out of 5 to. Now, go and watch yesterday's episode of the Wrestle Talk News, which goes into detail on that CM Punk AEW heat and all the backstage drama over there, and I was planning to read uh, the last road in again with my good friend, British wrestling legend Kendo Nagasaki, but unfortunately, I've left the book at home, so I'm actually going to look at this blank piece of paper and pretend it's the comic book. Hangman Adam Page calling his toys peg warmers, a term used in the retail industry to describe toys oh. that never sell. This Cassandra figure from Doctor Who series.